Hi everyone, how are you all? Welcome to the ACNC's September webinar, where we're going to be taking some time to look at things your charity should be doing right now. Um, we hope you're all staying safe and well, uh, wherever you may be. My name is Chris Richards and I'm from the ACNC's education team. Um, joining me today is Louis. Hi Louis. Hey everyone. <laughs> now, before we start, a quick little run through uh, of some housekeeping points and bits and pieces. Um, if you've got any troubles with the audio for the webinar, you can try listening through your phone. Call the number listed in the email you'll have received upon sign up and put in the access code and you can listen to the webinar that way. Um, you can also type in a question at any time throughout the webinar. We've got our colleagues Alana and Matt helping us respond. So if there's any questions, feel free to zoom one through and uh, we'll get back in touch. We'll try and answer them all. Uh, but if we don't get round to it, feel free to send us an email uh, via education at acnc.gov.au and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Recording of this webinar, um, as well as all the slides, it's going to be published on the ACNC website within a day or so. Um, we've also included the slides uh, and a little rundown of some of the sites and uh, web links we're going to mention as handouts, so you can access them uh, via the GoToWebinar interface as well. Um, we're going to also send out an email after we're done too, and that'll have all those links um, so you don't have to scribble all this stuff down as we go. Um, last thing, we, as usual, value your feedback. So if you've got any suggestions for ways we can improve our webinars, let us know in the short survey at the end of uh, proceedings today. So first things first, and let's see if the arrow key works, he says, hoping. There we go, excellent what we're going to cover today. So um, our aim today is to provide you with some short, I guess, practical ideas and tips that you can set in place uh, in your charity to help your charities work now and, and also into the future. Some of these ideas might be sort of right up your alley, things, things that suit you. Some might be ones that you might want to file away uh, later for future reference. Some might be things that you're already doing. If so, you know, double thumbs up, great stuff. We all know we're working in a bit of a changed landscape at the moment. Many charities are already altering how they work and what they do. We hope if some, some of what we go through today uh, might spark a thought, an idea, some action in, in your mind and, and result in some, I guess, practical improvements and some steps going forward. So some of the things we're going to cover today are, let's see what we've got. We've got, uh, we're going to have a bit of a look uh, take a bit of a step back and rethink meetings and and how to engage your volunteers. What else are we What else are we going to look at, Louis? Um, we're going to be taking a proper uh, taking proper and permanent steps towards diversifying your charity's fundraising, as well as working to promote your charity and the work it does. Um, we'll consider collaboration and we'll work our way through some of that dreaded paperwork uh, or at least think about some of the some of the paperwork your charity may need to be doing um, and we'll round things out with some quick tips and questions at the end. Indeed, indeed, uh, that paperwork. Um, now look, first thing we're going to get into, um, we're going to look at uh, some bits and pieces and aspects about rethinking meetings. Um, look, meetings are something that, have ch that has changed. Uh, it's quite obviously and, and quite clearly over the past few months. Um, many charity meetings, for example, um, might have gone online this year out, out of necessity. Yeah, um, but this necessity or this, uh, these circumstances can provide your charity with opportunity as well. And that opportunity is to think about how you can have more effective remote or online meetings um, and not just while we're affected by COVID to um, into the future as a permanent option if you need it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Now we've got some points here, some little sort of thought bubbles and things to think about. Um, for for current board members, um, there might be some, some challenges and some bits and pieces when it comes to, um, when it comes to meetings. Um, so, do existing board or, or committee members are there are there existing board or committee members that simply you know can't attend in-person meetings regularly or as they would like to know you know these be good people they'd like to attend they might not be able to they're 
they might have family commitments, they might be a bit time poor, um, they might have issues getting to and from meetings, they might simply be, be having all manner of other commitments right now as well. Question or, or a bit of a thought process here is, is whether these people are better able or, or more available to attend remote uh, or online meetings um, and in turn be more involved and provide more for your charity. Yeah, and um, also what about new or prospective board members that haven't joined the board due to the challenge of attending meetings? Because some of the reasons we've already mentioned, uh, if meetings are online, maybe they will, and that's a benefit for your charity. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, there's also perhaps benefits here for, for volunteers, for members, um, for, for supporters as well. Um, is there an ability there for them to be more involved uh, in, in your organisation, in, in the organisation they support, if you staged meetings online? Could this involvement result in better engagement in your charity? Um, and, a, and maybe a higher likelihood that, that people will be willing to get involved in its activities, um, help fundraise in whatever way, shape or form, uh, donate, ask questions of the board or committee, um, yeah, stay on as, as part of your organisation, as we mentioned here, you know, retention as, as members and volunteers. Um, some, some things or, or I guess, you know, things to think about when you can uh, perhaps, or about how you can perhaps integrate online meetings into your charity's usual schedule. Um, when you're thinking about this, you probably should consider making sure that your online meeting platform is easy to use and accessible. Um, now there's plenty of these platforms around, a lot of them have um, free, uh, I guess, versions that uh, can be used and, and um, they will have you know, limited uh, capabilities, but those limited capabilities might suit your meetings absolutely perfectly. So have a bit of a scope uh, around and a bit of a look around at some of these platforms, find one that's that's good for you, that works, is easy to use for, for people as well. Um, ensure meeting agendas are available before your online meeting. Now that's a, that's a big one. They can be distributed if you're having remote meetings, maybe electronically uh, or, or as a file in a, in a shared drive for, for people who need to access it uh, so that they can access it. Um, and also in this, in this way to ensure that your governing document is clear on allowing online meetings and that they're staged in accordance with your governing document uh, and also with best practice and to align with your charities, you know, your obligations, ongoing obligations to uh, the ACNC's governance standards. That's right. And we've got a lot more information on our website. Um, we've got a great guide to online or remote meetings um, at our website. You can just go to, as it's got on the screen here, uh, acnc.gov.au forward slash remote meetings, all in one word. And you can also have a look at um, the AICD. So that's the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Um, they have, a, they have a good piece of guidance on virtual meetings for not-for-profits uh, mm -hmm. and you can search for it on their website which is just aicd.companydirectors.com.au. Yeah and good. Uh, what we'll do too with, with some of these links as we go through today, we'll, um, we'll ensure uh, Matt uh, who's working with Alana in the background here is going to um, zoom some of these links through, uh, through the uh, chat um, so that you've got them handy, you can cut and paste uh, what, whatever you need to do. Again, they'll also be included in the email on, uh, that we send out later on. So um, just keep an eye on the chat for that information uh, as we go through. Um, next topic, next issue we want to broach a little bit is, is engaging volunteers. Um, now look, we know traditional volunteer, volunteering has been at the very least affected but in some ways curtailed um, in recent times. For some charities it's seen a loss in their ability to engage with volunteers or their ability to you know use their expertise uh, and most importantly uh, utilise their, their willingness to help the charity they believe in um, you know at this time but also into the future. That's right. And again, charities have been thinking about ways um, they can engage their volunteers differently. Uh, it's something that has obvious benefits for your charity now, but also very real rewards and benefits into the future. 
Yeah, um, now some thoughts along these lines. Um, I guess the first thing to think about is virtual volunteering an option uh, for you? And really, perhaps it should be. Um, look, virtual volunteering, it sounds pretty fancy. It's just uh, another way for thinking of ways your volunteers can help you without actually being able to be where they would normally be um, physically, I suppose. That might be on site, might be um, on, on, at your charity's premises. So when you're thinking about the term virtual volunteering, that's you know a pretty down-to-earth way, I guess, of, of looking at it. Yeah, and so how can people who want to donate their time and expertise continue to do so virtually? I mean, there'll be many charities that already have had volunteers answering calls and responding to inquiries from home. Um, and of course this can continue, but, and this is especially true for smaller charities. Uh, can you empower your volunteers to do other things virtually? Um, can they maintain and build your website, do your accounts, coordinate applications for funding or grants, marketing, communications, um, meeting with supporters or sponsors electronically. Um, they could do tech support or other volunteering tasks that don't require them to be literally present at the premises. Um, or, you know, can they do tasks or use their skills and talents to help fundraise for you, like making items or creating things along those lines. You can really be inventive in this sort of way and um, just think creatively for this. Yeah, and, and, um, and on this too, um, having volunteers doing some of these things, you know, they may, that may help you save money as well. Um, now we're going to look at fundraising in a second um, and we've looked at fundraising in a couple of other recent webinars, but during times like this, saving money is just as important as generating income. Uh, and for every penny saved through adapting, through having volunteers support you in different ways, using them in these ways, even collaborating with others, which is another topic we'll come to later. Um, saving a penny that way, a penny saved is a penny earned, um, and it's a penny that you don't have to generate through fundraising. So, you know, moving thought forward, is it worth thinking about how you can integrate, say, traditional volunteering, with quote marks around it, with virtual volunteering? Um, do you need to alter the way um, that you look to attract volunteers? Um, do you need to better promote options and opportunities for them to volunteer virtually or, or from anywhere? Um, you know, getting the word out uh, that you would accept and, and welcome virtual volunteers um, and some of the things they can volunteer to do in order to help you or, or raise funds for you. Um, if people are going to create items to raise funds for you through, through their virtual volunteering creative efforts, how will they get these items to you? Um, you know, post, post courier, cost considerations, all those, there's some of those things that you can think about as well. Do you need to update your volunteering policies, procedures, inductions, uh, those type of things <clears throat> um, to ensure that virtual volunteering is covered inside those policies? Uh, if people are gonna be volunteering virtually, how are you gonna support them? Um, will they need certain IT equipment? Will they need access to shared drives, um, files, applications, etc.? How will this be done? How it will be managed? Um, are there other considerations you need to think of? One last thing, keeping your volunteers engaged virtually can be a challenge, especially if you're a charity that has volunteers working together or gathering in groups to catch up or work on a semi-regular basis. Consider how you can adapt um, if people aren't catching up in person, if people aren't gathering in the normal volunteering ways that they do, how can you adapt? Can you hold virtual catch-ups via online applications? Those meeting applications that we might have mentioned before, they can also be used to do catch-ups as well. Can you communicate with them directly via email updates uh, or, or newsletters specifically aimed at your volunteers to keep them engaged and to keep them involved? Again, think outside the box, think creatively as well. That's right. And so the ACNC also has um, a short guide on engaging volunteers, which might help you out. Um, you can see a link on the screen right here um, to that. So um, there's a great bit of um, information on virtual volunteering on the Our Community website as well. Um, if you go to the Our Community homepage and just search online volunteering, as it says there, um, you'll find the resource they have available. 
Um, and so it is also worth visiting the websites of state, territory or national volunteering organisations um, and PEAKS for information, guidance and resources. Yeah, definitely. Um, Cushnet wide when you're looking at around the uh, around the web here, there's there's definitely a number of places you can go and have a bit of a look to get some ideas and some resources. Um, diversifying fundraising is uh, is our next item on the agenda, um, and not just paying lip service to it. To perhaps consider the ways that charities can look at you know properly permanently diversifying fundraising. Um, a diverse menu, we'll call it a menu, um, of fundraising options, it should always be the aim of any charity. Um, don't always put your eggs, well all your eggs in one basket. You should spread the load, spread the um, spread the burden a little bit. Having a narrow range of options um, or again being entirely reliant on one single stream or style of fundraising. Um, it's a recipe for serious trouble at any time, um, but particularly now, as as some charities have observed, of some charities have have experienced as well. Yeah, that's right. And um, a number of the challenges that um, charities have faced during the 2020 have resulted directly because of the restrictions in place in the current climate, um, putting a dent in fundraising. So these are things like not being able to stage their usual fundraising, uh, not being able to um, have any sort of fundraising events, um, not being able to fundraise face-to-face, -face, or not being able to engage with existing donors as you normally would, um, nor, cultivate, nor cultivate sorry, new donors and supporters. Yeah, and look, many charities have adapted um, either beforehand or even you know, by necessity, um, you know, online donations have been the most obvious and noteworthy of those adaptions. But what about real permanent sort of sustainable change in, in fundraising methods, in streams uh, of fundraising, in, in those types of details, which can see your charity step onwards um, with more confidence and, and maybe in a way that's better prepared um, to see your charity make the most of any opportunities that might come up. Um, now, what are, what are some of the things that we should be thinking about here, Libby? Um, some, of the, some of the thoughts here include virtual events, so like talks, sales, auctions, tours, speaking events, walk, uh, walks or runs, so like where you can all go out and run on your own, um, galas, mm. raffles, um, the list here is long and varied, um, with so many spots on the internet providing ideas for the types of things you can stage online with <coughs> fundraising occurring through people paying to attend virtually um, or purchasing items or simply just bidding on things. Um, there are plenty of online platforms your charity can use to organise and prevent, um, present these events as well as to accept donations or funds. Um and look, even I guess the simple act of paying uh, for things now, in many ways, has, has changed again. Um, you know, cash has, in in some circumstances, made way for um, you know, electronic payments and that sort of stuff. Um, you know, have you spoken with your bank? Have you spoken with your financial institution to to organise? You know, a proper. Uh, electronic payment uh, facilities, you know, tap and go, uh, those sorts of things. So people can donate electronically rather than in cash. If you're holding things online and people need to donate via, you know, have you got all that sort of stuff set out where they can put in their credit card details in a safe and secure way and, and all of those bits and pieces. Providing, you know, these types of opportunities and these types of options can open up uh, chances for more people to donate. Um, another thing to think about is what is your actual mix of in-person fundraisers? Um, you know, your, your events, your, your, your tin rattles, uh, your, your sales, your, your stalls that you might, might have held. Um, what's your mix of those and electronic fundraisers? Um, how can you diversify and share the burden more evenly? Have you gone too far or have you got all your eggs in one basket and not in you know, an, a shared sort of, uh, a shared sort of uh, more even way. Online fundraisers are 
as a number of charities have found, they're not the instant answer to everything, um, nor are they going to make up for the entire absence of, of what we might say is normal fundraising. So, you know, more than ever, sharing the burden and, and diversifying fundraising, uh, those sorts of things are vital. Yeah, that's right. And so another thing to consider is, do you draw from only two to three sources of fundraising or do you cast your net wider than that? Uh, a diverse fundraising menu, so to speak, keeps fundraising balanced and ensures your charity is not pulling, putting all its fundraising eggs into one basket. Um, how can your volunteers and supporters help as well? Um, can they make things to sell? or can they raise money through their expertise, such as IT knowledge or other services? Into the future, can you, can you collaborate with other organizations um, or charities and like-minded types to raise funds? Can you jointly stage an event? Can you work together on a fundraiser? Can you submit joint grants or funding applica applications? Um, is there a couple of things that you can consider outside of that? Definitely, um, and look, if you're, investigating new or more diverse ways to fundraise um, and, and looking to follow some of those into the into the future. Um, again, another thing to have a bit of a think about is whether your current fundraising policies um, keep pace with, with these changes um, or is there a need for you to perhaps sit down uh, and update um, to, you know, take in the process linked to, you know, virtual events you know, electronic donations and, 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 you know, money handling in that sense. Um, you know, chances to increase contact with vulnerable people if, if that's relevant, you know, those, those sorts of things. Um, so again, keep in mind that if you're making a change to something that you do, you do, part of going through those processes is to have a look at what policies, what procedures you have in place and make sure that they are keeping up with the changes that you're making as well. Um, now look, our ACNC fundraising hub, um, that has plenty of great information about fundraising, as well as the links to various state and territory regulators who, who look after, um, you know, uh, fundraising regulation. Um, it is important that when you're looking at fundraising, you need to ensure that you've got, you know, the proper permits in place uh, and you're seeking them out from the relevant state and territory fundraising authorities. Um, a second link here is is to uh, our community. Now they've long talked about what they call the seven pillars of fundraising, uh, and they've also long talked about uh, the importance of diversity in in fundraising sources and the opportunities that that this type of diversity can bring. Um, now, if you go to their homepage, which is listed there, if you search fundraising pillars, um, their information, their article on on uh, the seven pillars of fundraising will come up. We'll again also zoom that link through to um, through to you all via the chat so that you've got that there as well. So have a look at those two two spots um, and have a bit of a think about the diversification of your of your fundraising. Yeah so when it comes to promoting your charity, um, fundraising in person and staging those so-called traditional event traditional events, sorry often serves a secondary purpose of promotion, um, getting your name out there and increasing your profile. Um, again, change circumstances might see your charity's profile and visibility take a bit of a dip. Um, if you aren't out there, if your name isn't on a fundraising poster or at the bottom of raffle tickets or on a chalkboard at a Bunnings sausage sizzle, for example. <laughs> Definitely. Um, now, there are ways that you can, you can compensate for this. Um, there's some things that your charity should perhaps be aware of and, and, and look at doing. Um, first thing to, to have a look at is, is web presence, your, your charity's web presence. Um, how does your organisation's website look? It, it's always important to keep your website and, and your online presence up to date, but right now in the absence of maybe a number of other direct ways to promote your charity and get your name out there, get your work out there, it's probably even more important. Um, ensure your website looks good. That's a, a good starting point. But it also, in, again, ensure that it's updated um, and kept up to date. This might be something, again, a volunteer can do. Uh, it doesn't mean that your website has to be some you know, masterpiece work of art. 
but it should be functional, it should look good, should be updated, um, you know, should be vibrant, it looks like it's, you know, active and lived in, I guess. Um, your website homepage can maybe quite easily include a nice little section of, of latest news or information, um, which is, is again kept updated. Um, there might be some good relevant visuals if possible, uh, links to other ways that you're promoting your work, you know, um, some of your reports, your past events, fundraisers, um, calls to action, you know, uh, promotions of your work, documents, um, links to where people can donate and support you. Now that is an important one. Um, you've got to make it easy. If people do come across your web page, make sure that they know if they, they're impressed and they want to, that they can donate to you. Um, most of this stuff you'll probably already have, let's, let's be honest, but make sure it's up to date. Your latest news shouldn't be something from 2018, for example. Your fundraising and your support us or donate to us links should of course work. Um, all that sort of stuff. If you're displaying the ACNC registered charity tick, um, you know, ensure that it's displayed prominently, just ensure that it's displayed in the right way. Um, if you're able to display it, you may as well put it up there. Yeah, that's right. And so, so uh, social media presence is another thing you can also be looking at too. Um, so what's your Facebook page like? Are you keeping it updated and posting semi-regularly or are you interacting with people? Social media, when used well, can be, a invalu can be invaluable in times like these to keep supporters, members, donors, um, and volunteers and others in the loop and involved. Um, we've got a handy page on our website um, in the small charities library that looks at small charities and social media and has some handy tips and, and information. So if you're looking for that, just search up Small Charities Library on the ACNC website. Yeah, um, definitely. And again, we'll get that link through to you, I think in the chat as well. If that's not the case, we'll have it in our, our follow-up email um, and, and all that sort of stuff. And just on the the social media side of thing is, things is, as many of you might know, um, you know, you might not have a website. Social media might be your website. Your Facebook page might be your website. Um, charities often use social media pages as websites in that sort of default, de facto way. So, you know, if that applies to your charity, no problems, no issues at all. But just ensure that, that your website, be it a website or be it a social media page, is kept updated kept monitored and it's it's active and and it, and again it looks lived in it looks you know people come and know that there's stuff happening so um make sure that that's the case now another thing that you can do to promote your your charity and this one relates directly to um the acnc is that uh there's some work linked to the 2020 annual information statement in the 2020 ais Charities have the chance to provide information about their programs, the, the work that they do. Um, you know, not only the work that they do, but who you help, all those sorts of things. When you provide this information via the 2020 AIS, that information will appear on your charity's page in the ACNC charity register. Yeah, and because your charity register page can be viewed by anyone, having more information about the work you do on it can help your charity attract volunteers and supporters, members or even donors. Um, this is the whole idea behind us asking these questions about your charity's programs. We at the ACNC are encouraging charities to do this so that your charity register page can be another tool that you can use to attract support. Yeah, and, and look, that, that's a bottom line sort of message here that we want the charity register page that you have on the ACNC website to be something that is of use to you as a charity, that draws people in, that informs people, that can uh, get them interested in what you do uh, and, and can get them involved in what you do as well. So um, the, the questions in the AIS surrounding programs. Look, they're, they're pretty straightforward. Um, even better, we've got a, a spot on the ACNC website where it's like a little practice sandbox almost. What you can do in that is you can read the questions that, that we're going to 
that we're asking before you actually get into your AIS. And um, you can have a bit of a, a look around at how to answer them and have a little, little bit of a practice run of some of your responses. Now, it's called the Program Previewer. The link's there on the, on the site. Um, again, we'll, we'll get that link through to you um, as well. Um, and look, what we'll, what we'll, well, I'll, I'll start that bit again. Before you jump in and do your proper AIS, what you should perhaps do, jump into the Program Previewer, practice filling in this part of the form that relates to programs, relates to your programs. Um, and, and we'll do so in a way that I guess really classifies and promotes the work that you do so that people are very clear on what you do, what areas you work in, that sort of stuff. Um, so go through this page the, the, via the program preview or take your time, read the instructions and practice the questions. Now, once you've done it, you can print out the information that you've entered in uh, as part of um, your practice run, I suppose. And what you can do is you can have it on hand. So when you go and do the, the 2020 AIS, when your charity does that, you can just replicate it. You can, um, you can type out what you've done. You can have a look at it as a draft and maybe you can modify um, what, you've, what you've put forward. Um, providing this sort of detail is, is a great way to, again, use the ACNC website the, uh, the AIS and your charity register page. Uh, these things that are there anyway that, that you need to, you need to do an AIS obviously. You need, you're gonna have a listing on the charity register. So if that's the case, why not use them to your benefit? Um, so doing this is a great way to get the word out about your programs, uh, about your work, and it costs your charity nothing in terms of finances. It might cost it a little bit of time and thought, but you know, it's, it's something that, uh, for that little bit of time and thought, the returns can be pretty decent. Um, so go have a look, uh, Program Previewer. Um, collaboration, I think, might be the next thing on the agenda, Louis. That's right. So collaboration, um, it can be a challenging topic to approach, um, but sometimes there can be some apprehen apprehension for charities to consider collaboration um, as a whole. Uh, there might be a mindset that doing so would be seen as a loss of control or a loss of your charity's independence, um, that it might be the first step towards merging even. Yeah, and that, look, that's all fair and reasonable. That's their fair and reasonable thoughts. But look, collaboration isn't really any of those things. And it, look, it really shouldn't be any of those things. Um, what collaboration should be is it, it should be I guess just a willingness to work with others towards the best outcome for your beneficiaries, the, those people or those things that you you help or, or support. That's I guess how uh, you should be viewing you know collaboration. And some things to think about here: um, just have a think about a specific program or project that might be that might benefit from collaboration with a like-minded organization or an organization that can complement what you do with some qualities of their own. Mm. Um, would any collaboration be just for one project or program or could it be for more things in the future? Mm. What steps would you need to take to make the collaboration work such as meetings or policies and agreements, things like that? Yeah, and when you're thinking about collaboration, it's also worthwhile thinking about I guess perhaps the very simple ways you and another charity or another organisation could work together. Um, some of these things you might already be doing, some of these things might not be 100% relevant, now they might be in the future, but you know, some of these things might be, say, sharing premises, um, particularly right now if you know, you're, you've found that you maybe don't need all of your premises because there's a lot of people working remotely or when things get back to some level of normal, um, you will perhaps not have to have as many people in your premises at the one time. Is there an opportunity to share premises? Um, is there an opportunity to share resources or equipment? Um, IT equipment, for example, um, supplies, all those sorts of things. Um, can you and another organisation or another charity, can you organise to have bulk orders of, of items or supplies, you know, um, that both of you need? Maybe by doing so you can save money, um, buying in bulk as I say. Um, you know, the, these sorts of things are practical, they can save charities money, they can help you keep, 
ticking along. Um, collaboration also might mean you just sitting down with others, um, other other organisations, other charities for a talk, either virtual or, or, or in person when that's able to be done, if that's able to be done. Um, a bit of knowledge sharing, a bit of problem solving, um, those sorts of things. Um, look, having a cuppa, having a bit of a chat, be it virtual or otherwise, it's it's always a good thing. Um, and that can be of use as well. But with this, at least think about how your collaboration you know, might help your charity or, or what areas of your charity's work could perhaps benefit from working with others. Be, be aware of it as an option. Um, be aware of it as something that you can take up. It's something that's out there and it's an option that you can perhaps pursue. The old uh, paperwork. And, <laughs> yeah, last one here. And yeah, obviously it's not the most exciting thing. We we definitely know that. Um, I've heard that firsthand, but it really your charity should be um, and, or, and should already be um, ensuring that key documents and that type of important stuff is not only up to date, but reflective of any changes in the charity's work or methods that have occurred um, due to, say, COVID or other changed circumstances that are in place. Yeah, and um, look, if if the way that you, and we touched on this before, um, if the way your charity is working is changing, then your policies and processes need to reflect these changes. Now. For the most part, it might just mean that it's a tweak or two to some of your documents. Um, in other cases, it might mean that there's larger revisions required or you may need to sit down and actually do a new policy uh, or a new procedure. But what is vital is that your charity's paperwork reflects any changes in, in your methods or in your work. And so here are some thoughts and prompts to consider. Um, has your fundraising changed? Are you fundraising or generating income online now or are more people using electronic methods of donation than before? Um, these are things we mentioned earlier on in the webinar. Uh, and if so, does your fundraising policy need reviewing and updating? Similarly, your meetings. Are you meeting virtually now? Um, are you planning on making this an ongoing thing? And if so, review your meeting and decision-making policy, or at least be clear on the processes and procedures that go with your meetings, um, decision-making or declaration of conflicts of interest, um, voting agenda and meetings, meeting minute availability. Uh, these should just all be things that are cleared up um, yeah, around virtual definitely. meetings. Yeah. Um, all those sorts of things. Um, having clear procedure on this will help virtual meetings maintain their productivity. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's some bits and pieces in there with meetings and I mean, obviously you, you all polled meetings. So, you know, you, you know your own processes about that sort of stuff. So if there's things that perhaps might not fit what you're doing now, go back and have a look at them. A um, couple more things to have to think about is uh, your, your policies, and your processes around volunteers and staff, if, if you have them, um, for dealing with certain issues, for setting up activities. Um, it's likely they might need reviewing or, or perhaps altering uh, as, as well. Um, you know, for, say a volunteer's induction policy, uh, it might your inductions might be a little bit more challenging in times like this, so you may need to update it or you may need to have a look at it and review it. Um, the other thing, do you need any new policies to help govern some of the altered ways you do your work? Um, do you need, for example, a policy that might specifically relate to how your charity will address, again, we'll use COVID-19 here, among its, its people or volunteers uh, or, or programs or projects? Um, now, there's a number of organisations out there that have um, put together some sample you know, COVID-19 policies that cover some of these things. Again, go and surf the web and have a bit of a look and um, see if there's some stuff out there that you might be able to use or adapt. Yeah, and one final thought here. Um, as a charity, you operate for purpose and a change in a not-for-profit's purpose can have implications on its charitable or tax-deductible status. Um, 
so like it's DGR status. Mm -hmm. uh, reviewing your purpose is an important part of your charity's governance and it should be undertaken annually. Yeah, definitely. Um, and look, again, there's plenty of good policy templates for that sort of thing on, on the web. Um, the ACNC has some, as you can see uh, by the link there. Our community, we mentioned again, has got a, a number of good templates. NFP Law um, has has some as well. State and Territory Authorities um, might have some too. So again, get online, have a bit of a look around. A lot of these policies are sample policies. They can be adapted um, to suit uh, what you might need them to do, or they can just simply be a, a basis upon which you build um, to, to have a policy of your own. Now, um, we'll wander in. We've got some three or four, I guess, summing up helpful tips. Um, let's, let's see what we've got. What have we got, Louis? What's our, what's our first sort of couple? Hmm. So we've we've covered and discussed some key points that we hope what we've um, presented sparks some discussions and some thought at your charities. Um, uh, and perhaps provide a bit of guidance about things you can do, um, actions you can take, um, and tasks that you can get into and work on now. We hope we, we hope we offered up some things at your charity. Um, yeah, that you can act on and um, I guess we're just starting off with point number one um, yeah. here um, is just to jump back and have a look at your um, at our July webinar and, and managing money in the time of COVID-19. Yeah, um, and we don't often um, we don't often sort of go back and say to um, people to to um, refer to our previous webinars. Um, overtly in another webinar like this. Um, but we'll perhaps make an exception here because that webinar that we staged back in July um, has got a lot of really good information and details about financial considerations um, that you that you should have in, in mind. There's particularly near there's a, I guess an extended section on financial forecasting and some concepts and tips towards perhaps charities thinking ahead from a from a financial perspective uh, and planning and that sort of stuff. It's very practical. Um, it's well worth sort of watching the recording of it if you missed it back in July. So um, there's the address there, acncm.gov.au forward slash webinars if you click on the July session uh, to view the recording. Um, now I've interrupted you, Louis, I do apologize. What's the what's the second point that we've got here? No, it's all right. No stress. Um, so point number two, um, think of things you can do to make it easier for people to be involved or stay involved um, or even to just get involved in the first place with your charity. Make it easier to get to meetings and participate. Um, does this mean changing your meetings, um, your meeting arrangements and how that sort of works? Um, make it easy to donate by providing options um, like electronic donations and online options, things like that. And what about options to donate things that aren't money, that aren't money, um, things like goods or pro bono expertise, um, and also considering just what volunteering options there are, as in virtual volunteering is a good way, um, but there are other ways that they can do things um, for yeah, your charity. Definitely. Um, Number three, um, have a think about the cheap and effective ways you can perhaps use um, to promote your charity um, to keep its profile, I guess, out there. Um, we, look, we've highlighted a couple today. Um, obviously, you know, website slash social media being among them. Um, but again, remember that you can use your page on the charity register to promote your work too. Um, when you go through when you answer those those questions um, in the 2020 IAS, which uh, look at the programs uh, that you have. Um, again, uh, use the program previewer um, to practice your responses uh, in, in, you know, to these these questions. And that way you can polish them up so they're lovely and shiny before you jump in and do your actual uh, 2020 AIS. Um, what's what have we got here for point four, Louis? Yeah, so just another thing to consider here is are your policies, processes and procedures in a good place? Are they relevant um, not only for now, but for any change circumstances that your charity is looking at in the short 
medium or long-term future. Mm. If you need a review, tweak or edit policies, um, or if you need entirely new ones, get into it. Um, policies and procedures need to be reflective of and relevant to the work you do. Again, there are plenty of great policy templates and starting points around the web from a number of useful sources, sources including <laughs> the ACNC. <laughs> Definitely, including the ACNC. Um, yeah, and look, we'll again, we'll um, we'll zoom through some of those um, sources and and websites. Um, we've done that throughout the session today, and we'll continue to do that in the email that we that we do afterwards. Um, look, we've got a few minutes here. We won't hold you up because for most of you, it might be getting around about lunchtime. Um, we've reached the end of formal proceedings today. We've, again, just a reminder, we're recording what we're doing today. Um, the recording, the presentation slides, they're gonna be available on our website in the coming day or two. Um, that email will go out to people um, in the coming day or so as well uh, with the important links, references, links to the recording, or all, all of those stuff. Now we've gotten, we've managed to grab a couple of questions that have come through, um, through proceedings today. Um, Louis, did you wanna, what what was the first one we had? Yeah, so I'll just lead into this one. It's um it's a really common issue that I'm hearing a lot of people um asking about. It's yeah. um keeping things moving forward and driving what you do when you can't actually meet in person. Yeah. Um yeah, that is a challenge. Um <clears throat> it's it is, you're right, Louis. It's something that's that's been common, um, a common sort of a commonly expressed thing. Um, yeah, you, when you have a meeting, when you when you're in a room, you you get things done in your, that official sense. You know, motions and votes and decisions and all of that sort of stuff. Um, getting through agendas, you know. But there's also that informal discussion. There's some of that strategizing. There's that cooperative sense of getting things done. There's a catch up and and all those sorts of things. Um, and it happens before the meeting, after the meeting, you know, during the meeting as well. Um, obviously, with some of the restrictions that are happening now, uh, some of the some of the issues, um, you know, that's that's been a bit of a challenge. Now, in some parts at the moment, some of these restrictions on gatherings um, are, are gradually loosening. Um, and when that happens, there might be perhaps a chance for your charities people to start meeting in person again you know if you can and if if you you know if, if it's allowed you should perhaps consider doing so even if you maybe switch between in person and, and remote meetings um, but look if your charity is locked into remote meetings for now um, it's it's work and decision making you can still further it even when you're not meeting in in the same room um, you yeah, when you meet remotely I guess the key is that what you're going to be doing in the meeting you know that's spelled out in the agenda that's that agenda is available nice and early it's not something that gets distributed or, or um, made available on the day of the meeting you know you get it out a little bit early and ensure that everyone who needs to be at that meeting is invited to the meeting gets to the meeting can access the technology required for the meeting. Um, look, it might mean that you need to borrow some equipment or you might need the, you know, the tech savvy person in your organisation might need to offer a little bit of assistance here. Um, you know, the, the right apps might need to be downloaded. Um, and most of them are relatively easy to download and relatively easy to use. So that sort of stuff might be, need to be done before meeting time. Um, you know, on top of this sort of access and, and connectivity and stuff, um, you know, when you meet remotely, just make sure that some of the resolutions that, that you made, decisions you made are clear. Um, and most importantly, that there's always a bit of follow through on them. When you've made a decision or you've made a resolution, um, make sure they're clear, make sure there is a very clear sense of what needs to be done, make sure there are clear timelines in which it has to be done and make sure that there is someone who is responsible for either doing it or overseeing the task get done. Um, that will help drive forward, that will help drive your organisation forward, that will help drive things, your, your work forward. Then, you, I mean, you can then go back and double check, um, you know, during the meeting, you can say, even maybe straight after a decision is made, you know, um, you know, Joe Bloggs 
is responsible for this and we will check back in two weeks and then make sure that that's reflected in the minutes that are sent out rather promptly after the meeting as well you know so having place those those timelines where the people who are you know charged with certain tasks they might need to report back as well um, urge everyone in those decision making positions in your charity to communicate to report back to uh, stay in the loop um, you know it's important that these timelines that you might have in place to get things done um, emphasize how how important that is and, and emphasize how important it is for the charity's operation and, and how it is driven forward um, you know your, your charity's leaders your responsible people shouldn't be afraid of following up with each other and not in a nasty way not in a I'm checking up on you type of way but just a collaborative way where the the way the charity works is paramount to what you're trying to do so you know decision makers that you have should be as a group as a, as a team doing this sort of stuff um, checking up offering support where required if something needs a little bit more clarity you know let's let's work out what that clarity is and get back to it um, so yeah you know check in and report um, you know, communicate, do these sorts of things, I guess, consistently um, and, and actively. Now, um, again, we'll plug um, our remote meetings um, resource as well. Uh, that's acncv.gov.au forward slash remote meetings. He takes a deep breath. Um, that has a whole heap of good information about the nitty gritty of running remote meetings before the meeting, during the meeting, after the after the meeting as well. Um, now, have we got time for one more question? Yeah, all right. Well, we'll, we'll throw one more, and we do have another one um, that's come through. Um, something that we touched on a little bit earlier too, um, and looking at or well, how do I, you know, sa save money um, rather than acknowledging the dip in fundraising dollars that may have occurred for a number of char charities how do I save money on the other side of the ledger? Louis, um, what do we perhaps look at here? What are some of the things that maybe charities could think about here? Yeah, so quite a few people have asked that question, um, both before and during this webinar about fundraising and the challenges that they've faced lately. Um, I hope if, hopefully some of today's webinar helps, um, but it is it is also timely to, to note that um, on the other side of the coin, the capacity charities might have to save money during this time um, falls, um, sorry, it just, fundraising is harder these days and saving money can be just as important as that. Yeah. Um, and in our July webinar, we we discussed in detail um, charity financial forecasting with a bit of emphasis on forecasting conservatively and cutting expenditure to balance a full, a full in fundraising or revenue. Um, some of the things discussed in, that we discussed in that webinar included um, examining how changes um, in how you run or operate your charity could lead to savings now and into the future. For example, um, payments to hire meeting rooms or venues, even as far as any of the rent you pay on premises. Um, continued examination of fixed costs, things like rent or mortgage payments, loan repayments, technology agreements, security, insurance, um, how all these might be might be managed um, to reduce or defer them. So having a conversation with banks and lenders or landlord, landlords, funders or others to see what arrangements can be put in place or extended um, to reduce the amount of money you're paying on the, that front. Um, and also just have an informed discussion about your options as a as an organization. But ultimately you need to ask the questions about these things and have that conversation to to make sure that you're taking the right steps towards um, financial viability. Um, when carrying out this type of forecasting, it's vital that responsible persons are involved and are able to easily identify and outline core um, activities that the charities run. Um, that way there's a focus on you know how savings are linked to those core activities might drive the operations or ongoing viability of the charity. So again um, 
like we mentioned earlier, if you can visit the acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars to view that recording of the July webinar. Yeah, and those last couple of things you mentioned, Zoe, I mean, we, we again mentioned responsible persons or responsible people here. And again, we can't underestimate the role that, 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 that you have um, in this context to be able to as was mentioned, to to identify and and really know what the core activities of a charity is, and then have a look at some of the savings that you might have linked to those core activities, and how that might drive what you do, or how that might balance the other side of the coin on on a reduction in fundraising, for example. The, these things are vital. So, again, it's very much time for your leaders, your charity's leaders, to be engaged, involved communicating, collaborating, working together. Um, but that that probably goes without saying, I, I guess, but um, we'll, we'll emphasize it anyway. Um, look, we're just about done. Our, our hour is just about up. So um, what we'll do, as you can see up on the screen, here's some of the ways you can stay in touch with us. Um, website, um, our usual web guidance, uh, charitable purpose, e-monthly, another link to the webinars, another link, now there's some good podcasts as well, I'll, I'll mention those as well. Um, definitely go and have a listen to some of our uh, recent podcasts that deal with some of the challenges that that um, that are being faced at the moment, so definitely go and have a listen to some of those. Um, look, be, beyond that, I think it might be time to say farewell. Um, thank you to everyone who's, who's come along today. Um, Thank you, Louis, too. Thanks for um, coming on. It's really good to catch up with you again. Thanks, Eves. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for bearing with me. And, uh, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 so you're getting back into it by the end of it. It's, it's a practice thing. It's, that's all good. Um, yeah, absolutely. And thank, you, <laughs> thank you to Matt and thank you to um, Alana, too, for um, handling the questions in the background, also sending through some of those links to some of the websites that we mentioned um, through through the through the webinar as well. Um, before we go, just last thing, if you want to sign up to any of our future webinars, um, we've got oh dear, one, two, I think three more for the rest of the year. So have a look, see if any of them pique your interest. If so, go to uh, forward slash webinars, take a look. In the meantime, we look forward to catching up with you again sometime in the future, he says dropping his pen. Um, have a great day. Stay safe and be well, and we'll catch up soon. See you later. Bye.